from the headquarters of Telesur English in Caracas, Venezuela. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Interpol has issued a red notice against the leader of Colombia's National Liberation Army. The judiciary in Colombia has filed charges against Nicolás Rodríguez Bautista, alias Gabino, for aggravated homicide and criminal recruitment. Some fear this will put the peace dialogues with the ELN at risk. Meanwhile, FARC member Ivan Marquez says modifications made to the 2016 peace agreement are a betrayal. He believes the group was naive to lay down its weapons before the deal was implemented. On their part, Colombian authorities have accused him and another member of not being committed with peace. In this sense, all today, Ivan Marquez and Oscar Montero have given a first statement on wanting to continue with the process, it's very important that they respond to the judge. Our correspondent in Bogotá, José Manuel Jiménez, has more on this issue. The contents of the letter from Ivan Marquez and Oscar Montero were made public in Colombia on Tuesday. However, the controversial move was criticized by politicians who say the document should instead have been sent to the special jurisdiction for peace. It all began on September 17th when the Peace Commission wrote the two former FARC fighters whose whereabouts are unknown. The commission asked them if they intended to continue the peace process. Marquez and Montero wrote back to the commission. The FARC party has said it agrees with concerns outlined by Marquez and Montero about great difficulty in implementing peace agreements. The United Nations has called for its implementation and for an end to paramilitarism. That request has fallen on deaf ears. Instead, armed groups continue to murder social leaders across regions. They also say there is a serious problem with the delivery of justice. Case in point, the Jesus Santrich case. We still don't know whether or not he will be extradited. Months ago, public prosecutors announced that they are in possession of evidence in the form of audio recordings of persons allegedly involved in drug trafficking. However, just a few days ago, the very same public prosecutor said it is in fact the U.S. government which is in possession of that evidence and not them. Meanwhile, Marquez is attempting to discredit this evidence. The FARC has told Ivan Marquez to join the party and to follow the political path they signed in order to find solutions. Jose Manuel Jimenez from Colombia. Peru's Supreme Court has overturned the pardon given to the former president Alberto Fujimori. The court has ordered Fujimori's arrest. He will be returned to the prison where he was serving a 25-year sentence for human rights and human rights abuses. The court found grounds to uphold a civil appeal against the pardon granted last December by then-president Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Fujimori's pardon and release led to widespread protests and Kuczynski was forced to resign two months later. Fujimori's daughter Keiko says she will appeal the court's decision. She believes her father has the right to be pardoned. Today is one of the saddest days of our lives. It is extremely painful to know a judge from our country has taken away my father's freedom. Saying that because he is not dying, he has no right to a humanitarian pardon. The Peruvian government, on its part, says it respects the court's decision. In a public statement, the government says the judiciary has independence to take its decisions. Relatives of the victims of the Cantuta and the Barrios Altos crimes in Peru have responded to Fujimori's pardon annulment. The relatives have requested that the Board of Medical Examiners evaluate Fujimori, who was admitted to the Centennial Clinic in the afternoon. Family members have always been respectful of the judicial authorities in our country, their decision and the inter-American system of human rights. The resolution that was given today by Judge Núñez Yulca gives us peace of mind to know that we have been heard and that we feel respect by the justice systems 
that reflects the need to guarantee rights and justice for the victims. And therefore, comply with the sentence established to one of the people who was primarily responsible for the death and disappearance of our relatives. Our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, brings us the latest. We are outside the home of former President Alberto Fujimori. Just a few minutes ago, his daughter Keiko was here, but she quickly left after speaking to the media. She was literally in tears. She said this is one of the worst days of her life, as her father will have to return to prison again. We now await the judiciary's official instruction to the police to comply with the judge's order to detain the former president again. He had already been serving a 25-year sentence for crimes against humanity. Meanwhile, relatives of the victims and human rights organizations have said they will speak to the media as well, but they declare that justice has been served. A complaint had been filed at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights against the pardon Fujimori received. The International Court then asked the judiciary to review the decision and to determine if the pardon was in compliance with the law. Police forces are waiting outside Fujimori's home. They're waiting for an arrest order to be issued. Some supporters of the former president are also gathered here. Chile's Archbishop appeared at the prosecutor's office accused of covering up sex abuse by members of the clergy. Cardinal Ricardo Esati exercised his right to remain silent. He faces charges of concealing the sexual abuse and rape of at least seven children by priest Oscar Munoz, who was arrested in July of this year. The judiciary is currently investigating 119 sexual abuse cases and an alleged pedophile network in the Chilean church. The truth is, the right to remain silent is expressly established within our penal processing code for all those accused of crimes. Additionally, it's true that our legislation establishes a very important aspect, which is that to exercise that right does not bring about any negative consequences. Coming up, more stories. We'll be back. With four days to go until Brazil's general elections, the candidates are making their final bid for votes. A series of recent polls commissioned by the mainstream media show that the Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad is firmly in second place at around 21%. That puts him ahead of any rivals from the center-left and the center-right. But polls also suggest that far-right candidate Jair Bolsonaro has extended his lead in first place with around 31%. On Tuesday, Haddad warned that the Brazilian elite is trying to bring back the far right. Meanwhile, the leader of the landless workers movement, Joao Pedro Estedile, told Telesur he doesn't believe there is mass support for fascism in Brazil. We know that the fascists put all their financial and media resources and their influence over the courts into this. But we have the people. There is no real support for fascism in Brazilian society to sustain Bolsonaro's candidacy. So he's reached his peak of about 30%. He can't go beyond that. And in the second round, all the activists of all social movements will go door to door, explaining to people what this coup means, what the capitalists, the gringos, and the fascists want. And on October 28th, we'll achieve a great victory for Haddad. We're confident we'll win. Many are denouncing Argentina's President Mauricio Macri for inciting violence by using the same words used by Adolf Hitler in a tweet. According to several political leaders, Macri used the words social poison and evil people on his official Twitter account. These words were used in a passage in Hitler's book Mein Kampf. A number of political leaders say that he is promoting hate and intimidation. Let's hear from our correspondent, Edgardo Esteban, who explains what happened. A few days ago, as Macri was participating in a campaign event, he visited a pizza restaurant opened by a couple who were former public workers that were laid off due to Macri's labor reforms in the public sector. He praised their efforts, and a video of the meeting was published on social media. 
So this was strongly rejected by several sectors of society. Macri took to Twitter to respond to the critics accusing the Kitzner political supporters of attacking the couple using the words social poison and evil people, which are found in Adolf Hitler's book Mein Kampf. These actions were then denounced by political leaders, judges, constitutional attorneys and human rights defenders. This incident also related back to the fact that Macri's closest advisor, Jaime Duran Barba, also spoke about Hitler and called him a spectacular person. Widespread rejection of Macri continues to grow. And let's go to another story. Chile's President Sebastián Piñera looks to move past the sea access dispute with Bolivia. He said there is much more to life than Bolivia after meeting with former authorities and lawyers from the sea access case. Piñera says it is time to turn the page and look to the future. The International Court of Justice ruled on Monday that landlocked Bolivia can now force Chile to negotiate over granting it sovereign access to the Pacific Ocean. We've spoken about what our country's relationship with Latin America should be, what it should be with the United States, with the Pacific Asia, with Europe, and policies for the future because a country like ours that is so integrated with the world must have international policies and a strategy that anticipates the future. But Bolivian President Evo Morales has warned that the decision has serious contradictions. After his return from The Hague in the Netherlands, where he faced a ruling by the International Court of Justice that was favorable to Chile on the maritime case, President Evo Morales warned this was a contradiction. I want to say to the International Court of Justice that this hurts our people a lot. The International Court of Justice is supposed to stand for the people, so I have decided to personally send a letter demonstrating their contradictions. During a press conference, Morales spoke about several contradictions in the ruling. For example, the court accepted that Bolivia was founded with over 400 kilometers of coast in the Pacific Ocean and that bilateral treaties and commitments did not solve the conflict. And yet, the court was not able to provide a favorable solution. Eleven times the Organization of American States has resolved that there should be negotiations for sea access for a corridor with sovereignty without territorial compensation. So an international court of justice that does not listen to an entire group of people, what kind of court is it? The president reaffirmed that Bolivia will not quit on their goal of recovering sovereign access to the Pacific Ocean. Everyone born after 1879 have continued to think about the sea, because Chile unjustly with violence via an undeclared war invaded us and it's not possible that the court benefits the invaders, the transnationals. At the end, this is what happened. I feel that it is a court for the peoples and not for the transnationals that take territories to exploit natural resources. After five years of litigation, the International Court of Justice rejected the Bolivian petition that Chile must negotiate access to the sea for them. In 1879, Chile annexed the 120,000 square kilometers of territory that connected Bolivia with the Pacific Ocean. Now to Venezuela, where the National Constituent Assembly is discussing the framework to regulate its cryptocurrency, the Petro, which was launched globally earlier this week. Venezuela's cryptocurrency has become an international exchange currency. The Petro is a tool that is expected to attract new investments to the country. According to President Nicolás Maduro, it will be key for the country's economic recovery. October 1, 2018 is a historic date for Venezuela. A new technology has been born, our own technology, our own effort in a free and independent country. Our own oil-backed cryptocurrency, the Petro, has been born. Welcome, Petro. You're aimed at strengthening our economic recovery program. The National Constituent Assembly's Economic Commission has presented a bill to regulate the cryptocurrency market. The aim is fighting the economic war Venezuela is suffering. This bill approaches a series of concepts such as blockchain and crypto actives. It also proposes the creation of a superintendent to regulate cryptocurrency circulation in the country to establish the exchange mechanism and how the operation should be taken. 
So this bill is a revolution for the finances of the country and it gives us currency sovereignty. We believe it is a main contribution for the economic recovery program that wants to grow and prosperity. Venezuelans support the economic recovery program, whose main key is the digital currency. Experts say cryptocurrencies are the way to recover economic independence. The goal of this currency for Venezuela is to be able to use it in the foreign market, so both the state and private businessmen are able to trade globally, to sell and buy it with Petros. For instance, in the oil market, in the area called Petro Caribe, that's the proper place to start using Petro to replace dollars as exchange currency. Venezuela is set to increase its investments and international purchase throughout its cryptocurrency, the Petro. It will be negotiated through six international houses for the exchange of digital currencies. On October 29, Venezuela will also hold a meeting for cryptocurrency experts. We'll take one last short break, but stay with us. Thank you for joining us again. Russia's Energy Week is being held this week in Moscow with the purpose of evaluating the main hydrocarbon challenges. Our correspondent Hans Eloro brings us more. Russian Energy Week is being held in Moscow now until October 6, with the aim of discussing the different challenges in this sector. Russian Energy Minister Alexander Novak also explained that Russia has no intention of monopolizing the gas market in Europe, especially with the accusations made by U.S. President Donald Trump, who spoke about the alleged interference of Russia of energy. Russian President Vladimir Putin refers to the negotiations with competition by other countries we are interested in exporting natural gas to European countries. Remember that the President of the United States has made accusations about the Nord Stream pipeline which will be located in Russia below the Baltic Sea leading to Germany and transporting 55 billion cubic meters of gas. Astron was emphasizing the supposed dependence on European countries. They also discussed environment policies, oil production and the stability of crude oil prices on the international level, starting from the 2016 agreement seeking the balance of supply as well as demand. That was Hans Eloro from Russia. And Russia's President Vladimir Putin advocated for a multipolar world of respect and understanding in a speech on Wednesday. Putin said that Moscow has no plans to monopolize the gas market, while also saying that President Donald Trump has attempted to destabilize the oil market. Putin also spoke about the case of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal, who he described as a traitor to his country for lending himself to the manipulation of information. During the forum, the Russian head of state also denounced the terrorist methods used to attack the government and people of Venezuela. I've said this before, but I'll say it once more. We had a very good meeting with the United States president in Helsinki. Yes, we have touched this issue that we are discussing now the increase in oil prices. I will say, Trump, if you want to find responsibility for the increase in the oil price, you should look in the mirror. It is true, we just talk about geopolitical factors in price increases. It really affects the market. It is better not to interfere in the process of the market, not to try to obtain competitive advantage with the aid of political tools, and not to try to regulate the prices. The Venezuelan people must decide, nobody else in the world. As for the use of various tools of influence in the situation of Venezuela, there shouldn't be such strong influence in one direction or another. We influence mutually. They should not be tools that worsen the situation of citizens. It is a crucial question. Are we glad that people are living with difficulties there? Do we want to make it worse in order to get rid of Maduro? Not long ago, an attempt against him, an attempt to kill him. Are we going to salute this method of political struggle? I believe that this is 
I believe that it is completely unacceptable, not one, not another, or anything similar. A Palestinian teenager has been killed in Gaza during a protest in the border with Israel. The young boy died when a tear gas canister fired by Israeli troops hit him in the head. 24 people were wounded near the border fence of Gaza Strip. At least 193 Palestinians have been killed since March when the protests began. Canada has relaunched talks with indigenous tribes regarding the Trans Mountain Pipeline to the Pacific. The government was forced to dialogue with the communities after a court ruled that indigenous groups get a say in this project. Authorities promised to listen to their concerns as the pipeline is aimed at moving nearly 900,000 barrels of oil a day from Alberta province to the Pacific coast. Canadian scientist Donna Strickland is the first female to win the Physics Nobel Prize since 1963. Dr. Strickland has been awarded for the development of a new technique to create short, intense laser pulses. She says women have come a long way in science, but still steps need to be taken for female scientists to be recognized and fulfill their careers. Somalis have marked the 25th anniversary of the Battle of Mogadishu that left hundreds of civilians dead and seriously wounded. The 1993 battle involved U.S. forces against local militia loyal to the then upcoming President Mohamed Farah Ajit. The world knows the casualties that the battle caused. Whether it's about the lives lost, people losing their limbs, or the properties destroyed, more destruction has occurred. A high court judge in Zimbabwe has ordered state police to compensate a woman assaulted by security forces in a 2016 anti-government protest. According to court summons, Lilian Chinyerere was brutally assaulted by armed riot police officers while sitting near a court entrance. The officers kicked her and struck her several times with truncheons. Police was ordered to pay her $13,000. The family is investigated for profiting from government contracts in the energy and transport sectors. It's alleged that the family even interfered when it came to appointing ministers. The wife of Malaysia's former Prime Minister Rosma Mansour has been arrested and now faces money laundering charges. She was linked to a multi-billion dollar scandal that helped bring down the last government. She was previously questioned for several hours at the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission. Mansour faces up to 15 years in prison if convicted. The Asian city of Sabratha in Libya has been classified as an endangered site by UNESCO. Shell casings and bullets still litter the surroundings a year after clashes between rival armed groups. Locals say snipers positioned themselves at the top of the amphitheater, once a jewel of the Roman Empire. UNESCO declares Sabratha to be a risk, along with four other Libyan sites on its World Heritage list. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief. But this and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. Here you can find all our latest information, our videos, our top opinion articles, and you can search through topics and countries as well. So check it out. You can also join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.